Hello, James here. I'm about to show you some video. And this one I'm going to put it in. You know, I've been making videos and I know that it's not ever going to be popular. And I'm not, who knows, at some point in time, it's not going to, it don't get the highest reviews. But the, but the whole point about me making these videos is open up your eyes. I'm going to play a certain clips because I have to be very careful. Uh, try not to get any copyright strikes or anything. But the whole point of me making this video is to wake up America and the world and, and educate people on a certain topic of what's been going on. Why you seen these cases of I am going to do a video about why the young man got shot knocking on the wrong door. Uh, and it was it made major news. But first, when I get to this video, I'm going to have, I'm going to start with Leo. And he's going to tell you in his own words. The house of Pharaoh and also destroy the house of all the Egyptians, right? Y'all got to hear this. But the plagues would pass over the children of Israel who were also living in Egypt, the Passover, Exodus 12 and 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. Y'all got to hear this. I am the Lord thy God. The blood you will see will be a sign. Look, listen to this. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. Oh, this is good. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will strike you or will touch you when I strike down the Egyptians. Oh, this is too good. I feel like preaching already. You are going to see it, but it's going to pass over you. You might be living through it, right? You could be living through hell, but it's going to pass over you. You might see the destruction and the famines and the food shortages. You might be around the shutdowns and the lockdowns. You might see people dying of illnesses. Y'all gonna hear me? But it's gonna pass over you. The fire you might see, but it's gonna pass over you. Oh, this is so good. God said that the blood on the house, the blood in the house, the blood on you and your family, huh? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The Passover. The Passover. Mm. The Passover. They said don't pop your peas in the booth. The Passover. Easter is the weekend that we celebrate this Passover. It comes at the same time, right? Or around the same time most years, right? Easter is the weekend that we celebrate this Passover a lot of the time. So we celebrate this Passover where the biblical people were in captivity in a land. We are celebrating the fact that God brought his biblical people out of a land that they were in captivity here. Listen to what we're celebrating this weekend. They were a minority in a land that it was not there. Oh, that was not theirs. On average, they were the poor class in this land. They were servants in this land. Listen to what I'm saying. Uh, they were the majority employees in this land. They weren't the employers in Egypt. When they were in Egypt in captivity, they weren't the employers. They weren't the business owners, right? I'm talking about on average. A few of them were doing well, but the majority of the people that were Israelites, that were under captivity in Egypt, were doing bad. They were employees. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. They weren't the politicians or the leaders, right? I'm talking about on average of the whole nation. The politicians and the leaders weren't them. It was the Egyptians. Oh, I'm going somewhere right here, right? So on average, they were the underclass in Egypt, and they lived in the most non-desirable areas of this country. Listen to me, listen to me good. And God used his power, a miracle, a life-changing event, a world-changing event to bring them out of it. Exodus 20 and 2, I am the Lord thy God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. So Egypt means the land of slavery. It literally means that Egypt, which is translated as Miserim, or Miserim means the land of slavery. So the Lord Elohim, Yahuwah, he brought out these people who were in a lowly position.
position in this country who were oppressed and downtrodden in that condition and on Easter this is the event that we are all celebrating right oh listen to this ironically and I don't even have to tell you this but ironically the same position or condition that those people were in then parallels of people today I don't even have to tell you who the people are after everything I just preached you've already uh, no it's already hit you in your mind which is your spirit who these people are I don't even have to tell you so ironically there are similar uh, similarities between these people then and us today uh, those in Britain right now those in France us in America right if you just read the scriptures for yourself unbiasedly allow uh, look look with the renewing of your mind and allow the spirit to come upon you ironically we are celebrating the fact that uh, the biblical Israelites came out of a captivity then, but ironically, hypocritically, we're not acknowledging a people that are in the same condition that they were in right now today. Y'all don't want to hear this. This is too This is too much. This is too much. I want y'all to see something real quick because this is going to be good. I want y'all to see this, right? So I've seen the videos, right? Many, many videos. And every year we kind of do this over and over again where people say, you know, Easter is a pagan holiday. And then you see it on TikTok. Easter is a pagan holiday. And every video is, you know, talking about how Easter is a pagan holiday. But I'm going to go a little bit deeper than that with you today. And I'm going to blow all y'all mind with this. I want you to go to your phone, go to Google, and I want you to Google Easter in Spain. And then type out the word hoods next to it. So Easter in Spain, H O O. S, right? <laughs> Type that out in your Google, and I'm going to put up some of the articles in the images so you can see what comes up when you type out Easter in Spain hoods. So you can see where this. Yeah, we've played Texas a couple times, and everybody knows that Texas is a different animal. I'm excited to see what they think down in Texas. trying to define our sound for a long time, like even since I started. Hoods. So you can see where this holiday actually comes from because we know that all the peoples around this world, I mean, let's just say, let's just, let's just speak plainly here, all the Caucasian people around the world come from that area of Europe. We understand this, right? This isn't overly, this isn't, uh, 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 I'm dropping a jewel on you, or this is racist to say these days. We're just speaking truth here, right? They come from the area of Europe, right? We understand that Spain and uh, and, uh, and Greek and, and the Greeks and all of them were one nation at one time. We do want to have the Latinists. We understand this is in the Bible. And Jasher, 73, I, I mean 73 and 5. We can get into this deep right now, but I ain't got time to, right? So we understand that they come from the same area, right? The Greeks, right? And the Greeks became the Romans, just like the Britons became the Americans. We, these are the same people coming from the same area. These are their traditions. So when you Google Easter in Spain, hoods, and you get the uh, articles that you see, you start to start scratching your head and saying, what's going on here? What is going on here? You can get very similar pictures if you Google Christmas in the Netherlands slaves. You can get very similar. People always point to the fact that they're pagan, but they skip right over this. See, these pictures, hopefully these pictures are very shocking to some of y'all, but it shouldn't be shocking to none of us at all because it's proof of who we truly are, who the real biblical Israelites are. Jubilee 1 and 12, and I will hide my face from them, and I will deliver them into the hand of the Gentiles. Oh, wait, hold on. For captivity, and for prey, and for devouring, and I will remove, listen to this, and I will remove them from the midst of the land. So he says the Israelites are going to be removed from the midst of the land, and look what he's going to do to them. And I'm going to scatter them amongst the Gentiles. Mm. We're living right now in the last days. Who is scattered amongst the Gentiles? Who was scattered 400 years ago amongst the Gentiles? What is a Gentile? Who are the Gentiles? You go to any church in America, predominantly go to a white church. Now listen, I got to just pay a, 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 speak it plainly, right, if y'all want to hear it. 
If you want to hear, let's just speak it plainly. If you go to the black churches, they'll say the same thing, but they was taught where? In the seminaries by white uh, 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 professors and preachers. It's not like they were taught by black professors and black doctrine. you got to understand they live in white America. So seminary, any, any, any education that they learn, they learn from them. I'm just telling you how it was and what the truth is. Right? Don't come at me. Don't like me. Don't tweet me. Right? So listen to me. Who are the Gentiles? Go to any church in America. Go ask Joe Osteen. He'll tell you he's a Gentile. Go to any church in America. Stephen Futter, go ask him what he say he is. He's a Gentile. Right? Okay, so the scriptures right here says that God's people will be scattered amongst the Gentiles. What? What? And we already know Deuteronomy 28 68 says that they was going to be scattered on ships. So wait. Now we know for a fact that they scattered amongst the Gentiles and they were scattered their own ships. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. So I, so I want y'all to see. What is he talking about? Scattered among the ships. Oh. You want to know? No. No, James. Let, let, me, let me give you a couple of things what he was talking about. Let's go to Argentina. And then we go to go to Germany. Just two of many countries. My dog. The Afro-Argentines are black immigrants from Africa who were enslaved in Argentina in the 18th century. Their large numbers formed a significant part of the Argentina population, but after a few years, their numbers decreased. In 1778, according to a census carried out by the Spanish Council, it was discovered that the Afro-Argentines were about 37% of Argentina's population. Many years later, they dropped to about 15% of the total population, and now Argentina is currently the whitest country in South America. Due to the limited population of the Afros, it's almost impossible to find them in notable careers such as sports, journalism, politics, and many more. In this video, we are going to be talking about the Afro-Argentines and what led to their reduction and eradication in Argentina. Let's dive right in. Their history. In the 16th century, black people were captured from their homelands in Africa and enslaved with their feet and hands chained. Some were from Cape Verde Islands, while the majority were from ethnic groups speaking Bantu languages, from territories which comprise Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Republic of Congo. There were a few Yoruba and Uwe. In the 1600s, according to an estimate, 12 million African slaves got to Latin America through slave ships. But while passing through the Atlantic, about 10 to 15 percent of the captured slaves died, and many more died during the process of enslavement while traveling through the interior part of Africa. There's a record of about 40 deaths for every 100 slaves who successfully reached the New World. Some of these black men were captured and taken to Buenos Aires, which is the capital of Argentina. Their main commercial activity at the time was trading slaves for money. The slaves were forced to work in agriculture, livestock, domestic activities, and crafts. In urban areas, most slaves made handicrafts for sale, while the revenues earned went to their masters' pockets. The Buenos Aires neighborhood of San Telmo and Montserrat had a large number of slaves, although most were later sent to the interior provinces. Due to the profit earned from the business, the slave trade industry became prominent and about 70% of the trading activities in Buenos Aires involved capturing and importing slaves from Africa. Soon, it became a legalized trade in the country. In 1778, a census conducted by Juan José Salcedo of Vortes showed that there was a large number of blacks in regions where there were a lot of agricultural products. The percentage of blacks was about 50% of the total population, and this number continued to increase because of the continuous importation of slaves. In 1813, the slave trade business came to an end, but slavery itself continued until it was abolished in 1853. The Afro-Argentine culture in Argentina has a rich and complex history that dates back to the era of the Atlantic slave trade. While the country has a relatively small Afro-Argentine population today, estimated at around 1-2%, to their cultural contributions have been significant and have helped shape the country's identity. 
Afro-Argentine culture is an essential part of Argentina's diverse cultural heritage. Buenos Aires, which was once the center of the slave trading business, is currently admired for its clothing architecture and structural beauty. Denial of rights. From the colonial period till the 19th century, the Afro-Argentines were considered property rather than human beings and had no legal rights. Even after slavery was abolished in 1853, Afro-Argentines faced segregation and discrimination in many areas of life. They were often excluded from schools, churches, and other public institutions, and were forced to live in separate neighborhoods. Afro-Argentines were often excluded from well-paying jobs and were forced to work in menial or low-paying occupations. They also faced discrimination in hiring and promotion. They were often excluded from political participation and had little representation in government. They were also denied the right to vote until 1912. Many Afro-Argentines lost their land and property due to discriminatory laws and practices. They were often forced off their land or had their property seized without compensation. That happened here Black too. Black people couldn't attend universities before the law that got abolished too. in 1853. The white children had a longer number of schooling years than the black children because of racism. The 14 schools in Buenos Aires in 1857 only admitted two black children, although 15% of students that year were of color. They had no access to their health care centers. All of these resulted in their poor economic and financial status. What led to the decline of the Afro-Argentine's population? The Afro-Argentine population began to decline in the late 19th and early 20th centuries due to a combination of various factors. One of the main factors is the abolishment of slavery in Argentina in 1813. This led to a gradual decrease in the number of enslaved Africans and Afro-descendants. Its decrease was a result of an absence of a legal mechanism for importing new African slaves into the country, hence limiting the growth of the Afro-Argentine population. The Afro-Argentines and Argentines War also reduced the black population. When we broke out in 1810, and the Argentines fought for their independence. In 1816, they finally got their independence from Spain. However, the black men who were slaves during the war were forced to fight at the battlefronts. This led to a large death casualty of the black population. They might have assisted in fighting for independence, but the Argentines also used it as a way of reducing the population of blacks in their country. Maria Remedios del Val was one of the notable slave soldiers who fought during the war, alongside her husband and children. She fought in several battles and was known as Madre de la Patria, meaning mother of the nation, for her bravery and dedication to the cause. However, she lost her husband and son in the war and died of poverty in 1847. Another... Hi, my name is Alfonso and I got Botox cosmetic. So the lines that were bothering me before... Another notable slave is Jacinto Ventura the Molina. In 1773, he was born into slavery in Buenos Aires and fought in the Wars of Independence. He was wounded in the Battle of Salta in 1813 and died shortly after from his injuries. Are you enjoying this video? Like and subscribe to the new tourist channel. Do not forget to turn on notifications so you get notified whenever we upload interesting videos like this. Let's continue. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the government made a call for European immigrants and this caused an increase in the number of white people due to the Europeans who migrated. With more European immigrants in Argentina, the prospects for a whiter country were achieved. Due to interracial marriages, a new mixed race was created, and this kept reducing the black skin color. The European immigrants affected the labor market, with former slaves and their descendants facing increased competition for employment. There was a rise in economic competition, combined with racial prejudice and discrimination. Deteriorating health conditions was another major factor that led to their decrease in population. In 1864 and 1871, the Afro-Argentines lost a higher percentage of their population to cholera and the yellow fever epidemic, respectively. Many Afro-Argentines lived in precarious conditions, with limited access to basic services, such as clean water and sanitation. Moreover, they faced discrimination and social exclusion,
which limited their access to medical care and other resources that could help them prevent or treat the disease. They often had to rely on traditional medicine and home remedies, which were not always effective in treating the disease. This led to most of their deaths. The whitening cream and interracial marriages. As a result of the loss of black men in the 1810 war and the diseases, black women became the larger part of the Afro-Argentine population. This largely contributed to the rise of interracial marriages in Argentina. There were few black men, so the black women were left with two choices, to get married to an Argentinian man or contest for the few African men who were still alive. Most of the women chose the first option, while some chose the latter. These Afro-Argentines sought interracial marriages to climb up the social ladder because they felt they had no other alternative in the face of discrimination they got. To have a better life and enjoy citizenship rights, they had to opt for an option to make their offspring white. The new generation of people born from interracial marriages were referred to as the non-whites, which was a superficial term that embodied the government's denial of its racial diversity. If Argentina's current population were to be studied, it would be noticed that the non-whites population is higher than both the pure blacks and the whites population. Interracial marriages functioned like a white increase. Accompanied by the whitening was a loss in their black identity, not just in genetic makeup and skin color, but in consciousness as well. About 90% of the people in Argentina today who are identified to be white is proof that many Argentines are ignorant of their ancestry to the extent that they really can't tell if they are indeed white or they are descendants of Afro-Argentines. All of these factors contributed to the marginalization and eventual disappearance of the Afro-Argentine community. Today, Afro-Argentines make up a very small percentage of the overall population, estimated to be around 1% or less, and their cultural and historical contributions to Argentina are often overlooked and underrepresented. Afro-Argentines today. I'm going to stop it right here. And that's probably what they try to do here in America. White supremacy try to do the same thing here. But it, it, that's what was probably one of the conflicts. But oh, what was Leo talking about? You think it was in Argentina? This is what you're doing every time you buy a ticket for the lottery. Watch this what happened in Germany. Afro-Germans, otherwise known as the Black Germans, are citizens or residents of Germany that are from Sub-Saharan Africa. There were lots of Black people in Germany in the 18th century, but their number decreased after a while, causing few or no Afro-German in some parts Check of Germany. This out. Cities such as Hamburg and Frankfurt, which were formerly centers of occupation forces following World War II and more recent immigration, have substantial Afro-German communities. With modern trade and migration, communities such as Frankfurt, Berlin, Munich, and Cologne have an increasing number of Afro-Germans. Captain Prince Boarding and his twin brother Jerome are descendants from the Afro-Germans. In this video, we are going to be talking about the erasure of African descent in Germany and what led to their reduction. Stay tuned and learn more. Let's begin. History of Afro-Germans. Frederick William, a grand elector of Brandenburg, Prussia, founded the Brandenburg African Compartney in 1682. He also ordered the establishment of a fort on the coast of present-day Ghana to rival Europe's great sea powers. The fort was named Grab Friedrichsburg. It was designed to serve as a point of departure for the German slave trade. Years later, German slave ships, such as the Frederich III, transported thousands of African slaves. Some of the slaves ended up on the slave market of St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. St. Thomas is known to be the most prominent slave market in the world. Africans were brought as slaves from the western coast of Africa, where a number of German estates were established, primarily on the Gold Coast. Twelve Negro boys were brought from the western part of Africa. Six were decorated with golden chains and presented to the king. These enslaved children were later bought by their new masters, and they were taken to Potsdam and Berlin. King Friedrich Wilhelm, the first of Prussia, later sold his Ghana and Graf Friedrichsburg estates, situated in Africa in 1717. During this period, slaves were traded for German linen fabrics and interracial couples were pressured. 
Before World War I, thousands of black people lived in Germany, some of which came from Africa, North and South America, and the Caribbean. The First World War limited international travel and migration in 1914. The Germans imposed strict migration rules. Some that had traveled to the country for business only stayed for a while, then left before the war commenced. After World War I ended, the immigrants who were still in the country could not leave because they had no passports or travel documents. Hence, they were stranded in the country. The Erasure of the Afro-Germans The erasure of people of African descent from Germany is a gradual process that eventually occurred after several harsh conditions and laws. The Afro-Germans population largely declined during the Nazi regime. The Nazis, short for National Socialists, were a political party that rose to power in Germany in the 1930s, led by Adolf Hitler. The Nazi party was known for its extreme nationalism, racism, and totalitarianism, and sought to establish a fascist state based on these ideals. In the 19th century, several thousand blacks were living in Germany, but when the Nazis came into power, the blacks were harassed and persecuted. The Nazi regime promoted the idea of Aryan supremacy and aimed to purify the German population through eugenics and racial policies. Non-Aryans, including Jews, Roma, Sinti, homosexuals, disabled individuals, and people of African descent, were considered inferior and targeted for exclusion and persecution. During this period, the Nazis' policies became more extreme. They created laws that made most black people end up in prisons, hospitals, psychiatric facilities, and concentration camps. Many Afro-Germans were also forcibly conscripted into the German military during the war, and those who fought on the front lines faced additional discrimination and mistreatment. Some Afro-German soldiers were sent to the Eastern Front, where they were treated particularly harshly by their fellow soldiers and subjected to brutal conditions. A lot of Afro-Germans died during this period. This was one of the reasons which led to their decline in population. The Nuremberg Race Laws The Nazi regime declared the Nuremberg Race Laws in September 1935. These laws were put in place because of the Jews, but in November 1935, the law also affected the black and the Roman people. During this period, those of non-Aryan descent were called Gypsy. Ray Mayotte here. You need parts. eBay Motors ensures a guaranteed fit. Hey, Dave. Yep. Wait. How are those new wipers? The first Nuremberg Law was also known as the Reach Citizenship Law. It stated that a German citizen was of German origin or related by blood. This law was to exclude non aryans from political rights in Germany. The second law was for the protection of German blood and German honor. With this law, race mixing, otherwise known as race defilement, was banned. The law forbade intermarriage or sexual relations between the German or its related blood. This law aimed to prevent black people from marrying and having children with Germans. The Nuremberg race laws made it difficult for the blacks in Germany to marry or to build a future. Despite the laws against inter that's what's probably what they was trying to infiltrate over here in America. That's why when they out, they outlawed it here, this was probably based on the primacy of that because they were thinking that was going to happen. That's the reason why. But this is the history of it. What you see in Europe was all supposed to be placed in America. What you see in South America, white supremacy is a global thing. Racial couples, some blacks who were romantically engaged to the German Aryans got married, though the relationship was dangerous for both partners. The law pressured white German women to divorce their black husbands. They felt the presence of the Afro-Germans was a threat to their racial purity. Afro-Germans were popularly known as Rhineland bastards, a derogatory term used to describe people of mixed race ancestry. The detests for the African descent also made Bernhard Dernberg, the German director for colonial affairs, make a derogatory statement. He announced that some native tribes, just like some animals, must be destroyed. During this period, not only were the Africans hated, the Jews and some people who were not related to German blood were criticized. Black children were excluded from schools. They suffered a lot of criticism from their parents. They 
felt lonely, isolated, and excluded from society. The children wanted to be part of the German excitement, but that wasn't allowed. At first, the discrimination against school children was a local initiative, but things got worse when the Nazis took control of schooling and enforced formal bans against black students. The Nazi law completely banned Jewish children from attending German public schools. Let's stop here for a minute. Encourage us to continue making videos like this by liking this video and subscribe. Hold on. Let's go back to what he was saying.
I think we're going to see it. We're going to see it when we die. No, you finna see it right here with your eyes. The salvation of the Lord, which you shot unto this day, for the Egyptians, for the Americans who you see today, you shall see them again. You shall not see them again tomorrow. In the, in, in the Jasher, in Jasher 81 and 28, the, uh, it says, the same version, it says, And Moses said to them, Fear not and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Uh, listen, which uh, which he will effect for you today. So the salvation of the Lord, uh, you're going to see the effect of that, of that today. You're going to see the effect. Oh, this is good. Today, in this day, in this time, God is going to affect this day for you. These times, this day, Isaiah 45 and 17. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. He shall not be ashamed nor confounded a world without end. You're going to be a world without end. You're going to be a world without end. And as I just said, we are the true biblical Israelites. This is why our current situation literally parallels lines up almost exactly with their situation in. That's why God said the blood will be a sign. I'm showing you signs. Just like they always say, you know, I heard, 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 heard the pastor say, the Old Testament is a shadow of the New Testament, or what happened then is going to happen again, or the Old Testament is a shadow of the things to come in the future. You are that shadow. You are, you are living in it right now, here today. They was in Egypt for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of years, and now you are in Egypt for a certain amount of years. Your, your ancestors was in Babylon captivity for a certain amount of years, and now you are in a captivity for a certain amount of years, or in a Babylon, right, in a spiritual battle. They don't want to hear this truth, but he said today, in this present time, you are going to see the salvation of the Lord. Something miraculous is coming. Something supernatural is about to occur. There's a parting of the Red Sea event that's coming. And everybody feels it. Everybody feels it. You know what he says in second address? Uh, as the Lord draw neareth. Uh, what he said, uh, I'm going to draw neareth and, uh, and visit the, uh, the inhabitants of the earth. Everybody feels a polar shift coming. Everybody can tell that something out of this world, something we ain't never seen, is about to happen. And that is exactly what's about to happen to you. A people is about to receive reparations. A people is about to receive a restoration. A people, the lowest on it in all societies, listen to this, are about to receive adoration. The poor will be made rich and the weak will be made strong. Oh, they don't want this. First Chronicles 16 and 35. Then say, save us. O God of our salvation, and gather us and deliver us from the nations. Deliver us. Deliver us. Gather us. Save us. Salvation. Save us physically. Save us. I'm not saved. I'm about to be saved. I'm not delivered. I'm about to be delivered. Oh God. Huh, huh, they say, I already got salvation. You ain't received salvation yet. Go look up the definition of salvation. Matter of fact, one of the synonyms for salvation is reparations. Oh, your reparations is coming. Your restoration is coming. They don't want this. They don't want this. And the blood. And the blood. And the blood is a sign. The Passover. The blood is a sign.
shows up even in many of the Negro shopping habits. Anyone who sells or wants to sell to the Negro customer should know about some of these habits. Three habits in particular play a big part in every sales transaction. To begin with, most Negroes buy by brand. They ask for products by name. They're quick to turn down off brands. Do you wonder why? Well, listen to what this customer is thinking. Hmm. That last hat I bought just didn't hold up at all. You see, for a long time, the Negro has been sold a lot of shoddy, second-class merchandise. So now he asks for name brands in order to make sure he gets his money's worth. Buying by brand. That's the first important Negro buying habit. Now for the second. The Negro buys good quality merchandise. Symbols of quality and prestige are very important to the Negro customer. This woman, for example, is buying fine crystal wear. But she is also buying the admiration and approval of her friends and relatives. Listen to her thoughts. Isn't it beautiful? I can hardly wait to show it to Sally and Joe. It's a well-known fact that many Negro customers are influenced by the opinions of others. What their friends may think of a certain item often decides whether or not the sale is made. So remember, the Negro buys quality merchandise. That's the second important point. And here's the third thing to remember when selling to a Negro customer. When he specifically asks for one thing, don't try to sell him something else. Don't try to switch him at the point of sale. If you do, he'll probably react something like this. Doesn't he think I've got the money to pay for it? There's a reason for this reaction. Again, because he's had experience with cheap merchandise, Negro resents being offered a substitute. He wants to be sold on quality, not price. The Negro buys by brand, he buys quality, and he doesn't like to be switched at point of sale. These are the keys to selling the Negro customer. I went out and confronted these people with my person. I tried to bring them out of their heads because they have an imagination of their um, enemy but actually they don't need them so much what are you afraid about no comment you're better off leaving why are you doing this running your business damn business can you get out of the way What's your name? Go back to Africa. Why should I go to Africa? I was here born here. What do you have to plan to do with people like me? We have a different skin color. The project, how most of that mean, the national, uh, real nationals. This is in Germany. How do you think you can think of it? They are in the distance, we have been deported. Why is it that you shouldn't say 
even on a form that you are a member of a race. One thing is not true. But why is it not true? Race is racism. Okay? So if they say that you can name your race, what do you put there? You put VOR. That's what I put there. Victim of racism. That way they have to ask me, what does that mean? See, when you start putting things on paper that you invent, people have to ask you what it means. That is a form of power. The white supremacists understand this. Now, I have put that on official forms. Sometimes I put B slash B-O-R, black victim of racism. What's the response? Hmm? What's the response? The response? People look at it and, oh, uh, okay. That's a response I've always gotten. In that block where it says race, I put B slash B-O-R. It's not enough space, I just put B slash B-R. But it means the same thing, victim of racism. Because that's who I am. And if anybody asks me about it, that's what I say. I tell them that's what it means. I'm a victim of racism. I want the whole world to know that. You know, I'm more of that than I am anything. It's not just being black. That doesn't mean anything except somebody made it mean something. And what they made it mean is that I'm supposed to be pushed around. And who did that? The people that came up with this race designation in the first place. Because we didn't know nothing about that until the white supremacists told us. What, what, what does Mr. Fuller mean by that, James? Watch this. Our second lead story today, we are going to Ghana, where a group of lecturers and uh, student campaigners who have been campaigning for the removal of, removal of India's Mahatma Gandhi statue in September of 2016. Uh, some lecturers and students at the University of Ghana demanded that the statues of Mahatma Gandhi that was erected on their campus and uh, the reason for the agitation was Gandhi hated black people. Mahatma Gandhi, as it were, is known to be anti-black and a racist. The real Gandhi was a, was a hateful guy. The real Gandhi spewed racism against Africans. He called them kafirs. He was a racist. He was against Africans. He was divisive, racist, and classist, oppressive even toward his own people. And he says he has even denied talking about the Indians did not always have his privilege of riding in the same municipal sam cars with his white fellow colonists. If he cannot be pulled down by diplomatic means, in fact, I myself would, would not find it uh, difficult to rally people behind me to, to take it down violently. A statue of Mahatma Gandhi has been removed from a university campus in Ghana. It's a very sad time and interesting time. First question we asked ourselves is Was Mahatma Gandhi racist? The answer to that question is simple. Yes, Mahatma Gandhi was racist. In fact, the official organization for Gandhi wrote this about Mahatma Gandhi. But there is more to this story, and which is, yeah, it, it wasn't just Gandhi that was racist. In fact, somebody like Winston Churchill was publicly a racist. All you have to do is to search Google for Winston Churchill film on race. You are likely to get to this Wikipedia page. Don't be disappointed if what you read on this page make you angry as a black man. But then, there is even more important question I think we have to ask. Why was Mahatma Gandhi racist? Or why was Gandhi and Winston Churchill racist? In the period between 1650 and 1780, the concept of polygenism became popular in Europe. Polygenism was this idea that different human race came from different ancestors. I need you to pause a moment and think about the 
implementation of this concept. Now, think about it. Imagine that white people truly came from different ancestors and black people also came from different ancestors. Now, think about that. If this concept was true, it means we cannot possibly be the same people. We are going to be different species. And we are going to be different in intellect, in probably skeleton, in probably our blood, in our genes. We are going to be different in terms of our mental capacity. Yeah, I have a very sad news for you. And that is, starting from 17th century, you are having these famous European scientists coming to public, writing in the newspaper, radio, writing books. And they were making this claim that they have spent years, probably, in the laboratory to study different human races. And they have come to a very important conclusion. And that is, the gene of a black man is different from that of a white man. His skeleton is different. His blood is different. Wait for it, whether you believe it or not. These scientists actually claim that the brain of a black man is smaller than that of a white man. Franco Ispania was a 17th century French physician who traveled a whole lot. This guy claimed that he had traveled all across the globe and he had seen probably every race of human. In 1684, Bania published a famous article in a journal called Journal de Savant. In this publication, Bania divided human race into four according to their superior intellect. Then you have first class race, second class race, third class race, and fourth class race. In this same publication, Bania claimed that, listen to this, there are genetic differences between these four races. And according to him, one of those races, I mean, the last race is so bad and so inferior that it is close to animals. I struggle with the guilt, with being away from animals. In 1734, Henry Holm published this book. The title of the book was Sketch on the History of Man. And in this book, Holm claimed that climate, weather, or any other thing could not have explained the reason why different races have different look. So if different races, that is India, uh, black people, white people, have different facial features, like some of them are black, some of them are yellow, some of them are white, then, according to Holmes, it must be because these people came from distinct ancestors. And again, don't forget, if truly human they beings came this. from different ancestors, they will be different. They will have different genes, they will have different mental capacity, and somebody is going to be inferior to somebody. And again, think about this. If truly we are different from one another and certain people are superior, why should we respect one another? Lions do not respect buffalo. Tigers do not respect bears. And snakes do not respect rats. So why should we respect one another if we came from different ancestors? German anthropologist Franz Pruner published his own theory, which is essentially similar to everything I have told you. In 1798, a French zoologist, George Covia, published his own uh, publication in which he wrote this Black people are approximately monkeys. During this same era, Christomania published this book. In the book, he claimed that black people are very close to animals. They are having inferior genes, you know. Then you have Charles White, Richard Bradley, 
Thomas Jefferson, an address of famous and influential scientists of 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th century. All of them were saying the same thing. All of them were writing the same thing. All of them were confident about the same thing. All these people claim that as scientists, they have spent months and months and months in the laboratory and they have done their studies and they have come to a conclusion that you should trust. And that conclusion is every race, different race of humans came from different ancestors and some are superior to others. up this video this is how the way white supremacy is taught and shown so they this is what Nia Fuller was talking about all over the world this is what Leo was talking about all over as far as biblically we are the biblical people and so they have to replace us and colonize us with the mindset someone's with the mindset that we're less than then I had to bring it to the end and, t and, and basically tell you this is w what is pushed in all areas of education, religion, social, social status, and everything throughout the world. This is the reason why I made this video because it's the wake up a generation to know, yes, 
racism hasn't gone away. It transformed. And then you see the totem pole? Well, that's the totem pole. That's where I got that from. That That's reality, ladies and gentlemen. And they still believe it. And some people are racist. Not all, but in every sector or group, somebody learned that. And that's why when you see black people getting called monkeys, that's what it was based off of. Someone taught them that in different parts of the world. Not only in America, but even parts of you go in Europe, they, they're, going, they're doing what a, a chimpanzee do because they believe that. They, they taught white supremacy, taught the world this by the human race. And you see about the different classes of people. Now, do you now do you see wh wh why we talk about this? It's a generational thing, and you see what the attentions was. That is like even so far, some black people believe that, just like some white people, because when they found that out, like wait a minute, so if I blend my my blood into them, that means they're automatically superior. That, that they're going to have a high status, which you see in Argentina. But that was not just in Argentina. That's all over the world. That was even, there's some people in America and up in Canada and Britain and France and other places that believe this. There are some people that believe that. The subconscious racism is the thing I'm pointing out. That's subconscious. Some black people have been superiorly negro opinionized. To think that so we tear each other down and you see the re reason was everything from the history always repeats itself but it repeats itself from the past and it slowly moved into the generation of today that's why so you can't get over the past the spirit you can do something you can move on but you can't move on because it's the spirit of it the different parts of the world develop, the Western world develop racism. And some people subconsciously have racism in different parts of the world. And no matter what the person, what I look like in Latin America or in Europe and other, any other place that are still going through in a different language. And it's kind of hidden, even though in, in some parts of Asia, even in the Middle East, there are still people because there's a totem pole. Because of skin complexion. In other parts of the world, believe it or not. Even over in the, the most sacred land, Israel, has a totem pole. White supremacy is even taught in Tel Aviv. Go to Tel Aviv right now. Tel Aviv, Israel. You'll see, you got the Palestinians get, and the blacks and the Palestinians and other people, and even Muslims. You'll see it. Don't believe me? See, see so the Most High has to eradicate racism spiritually from the planet. He had to eradicate the system that these people put the ancient thing in the planet. That's why I say it's, it's spiritual. That's why I say that. It's been, been here for thousands of years. Now you see. You know, it's not just, I mean, it, it's in putting put in people. And so people, all races, are going to be content with the spirit in every part, part of Western society. You're going to deal with racism. No matter what part of the United States you live in, no what part of Europe you live in, Asia you live in, you're dealing with the same Latin America, you're dealing with the same. Brazil, where they speak Portuguese, is the same spirit. Same thing. Same condition. Condition these people to think that they're intellectually inferior. So I hope this was a teaching moment. I hope I hope this video goes through. Uh, but this ha had to, this had to, they had to put it all in perspective. But I guess in the end, we are the people in the Bible. That's what Leo was pointing out. That's why we're going through what we're going through. That's the good thing.
but that's all right because the most high is going to take us up out of this mess all right then ladies and gentlemen i hope you enjoyed this video share it with somebody and like i said this probably won't get a lot of views youtube will probably mess with algorithm i don't care belongs and get to somebody educate somebody in some part of the world no matter what regards what they look like it's a reality that i'm waking up like the other people on the internet all right then guys you have a good day and be blessed and to the people out there keep your head up it's gonna soon come to an end take care